30 years ago this week, America's cable companies created C-SPAN as a public service. And C-SPAN continues as the political network of record, bringing you the three C-SPAN television networks, C-SPAN Radio and C-SPAN.org. Washington Journal continues. We want to talk about President Obama, former President Bush, and Africa with Dana Perino, former White House Press Secretary. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I want to go back a couple of months to the morning of January 20th. You're at the White House. President Bush, incoming President Obama, meet for coffee. Take us back to that morning and what was going through your mind, what you were hearing, and what people were talking about. Well, that morning uh, was, you know, we, we, we built up to that morning for a long time. Obviously, every four to eight years, we have a new president uh, in our country. And so, uh, in some ways, there's a lot of tradition to be followed, but in others, it was all new to us as well. What was great about the transition was the camaraderie, uh, that had taken place between our two teams during that transition and I think it made every American proud and President Bush really set the tone and it was um, also uh, um, from his end uh, President Obama and uh, President-elect uh, told his team to work with us and then we did we followed through on that and I think that was one of the best uh, most rewarding professional moments of my career that morning in particular I remember um, I, I got to the White House I took the metro because the uh, obviously the roads were all going to be closed. We got there in the west wing, you know, they're getting ready to turn it over and walls were being painted, carpets were being replaced, although they'd gotten most of that done. Um, my team had pretty much uh, dispersed the night before, so I was alone. I got to see the president a little bit, uh, he gave me a big hug and then he uh, took one last walk around the south lawn and then he was ready to receive the president-elect and Mrs. Obama. And when they walked out, and they were waiting uh, for the um, Obama's limo to arrive, uh, the President and Mrs. Bush, who I've always admired for the, their close relationship, held hands and I thought, here they are, they're ready to start chapter two. And I was really proud of that moment because I thought, what a country we live in. Most countries don't have such peaceful transitions of power. And we really did, and it was, that was a really wonderful day for me. And then I left about 10 hours later. I was on an airplane and I went overseas for six weeks. And we want to talk about that, but let me go back to uh, the conversations. There have been at least one that uh, the White House has acknowledged between President Obama and President Bush. What role do you think he envisions himself, former President Bush, as a former president with this president or future administrations? Well, they did. They spoke more often than, than uh, you would think, and, but we didn't make all of that public because uh, it didn't need to be, but they had established I mean, since, a Since he's left office, there's oh, since, oh, you know, I, since I've just been uh, out of the country, I don't know how often they've talked. Uh, President Bush knew that once January 20th came, that he was going to be off the stage, and that's where he intended to stay. And you haven't seen him out publicly talking about any of the issues of the day, and uh, in some ways, 50 days seems like a long time, and in others, it's really not. And he will be available uh, for this president or any future president if they want to call and and listen to him but other than that I don't anticipate him to try to step on anybody's toes on any issue I think eventually you'll see President Bush uh, as he solidifies his um, uh, institute uh, move forward on some of those policy matters that that he cares about to further them but I think that that will be more in the lines of um, promoting national service um, helping those who are trying to establish uh, freedom and democracy in their own countries and continuing his work on HIV AIDS around the world and yet Vice President Cheney has been more visible. He's appearing on CNN today. Mm -hmm. He also publicly expressed his disappointment that Scooter Libby was not pardoned. Did that surprise you? No, not really. I mean, obviously, everybody, once you leave um, the White House, then you are a private citizen. And I think that, obviously, the Vice President was disappointed. Uh, and he expressed that. And I don't think that should, be, should come as a surprise to anybody, because I think he'd been very... Uh, vocal during the years that he thought that uh, Scooter Libby should have received a pardon. President Bush will deliver his first public speech in June in Pennsylvania. What do you think he's going to begin to speak about as he becomes more public in a couple of months? I don't know. I think that he will be talking about, well, I, I shouldn't say. I, I don't know what, what his speech specifically will be about, but I don't anticipate that it will be a point by point or a counterpoint when it comes to uh, current events. There's this this morning from the New York Times Sunday Magazine. George Bush's plans for his presidential center at SMU are controversial even before the ground has been broken. The question is whether it will be a place for scholars or for the pursuit of the former president's policies. 
What I can tell you is that uh, what I know what President Bush and Mrs. Bush want out of this institute, which is not something that is partisan, but a place where people can come and scholars or uh, people from other countries want to come and learn about how to uh, learn about freedom and democracy and how to make it work in their own countries. And I know that there's controversy. Lots of people try to speculate as to what's going to happen. And I think that they're putting the cart before the horse and getting themselves riled up over nothing. There's a headline yesterday in the Washington Post uh, that President Obama saying that he inherited this economy, blaming the economic issues on President Bush. How long can he do that? Well, I, you know, for a while, I guess. I mean, he can do it as long as he wants. The question is, is it the smartest communication strategy to be doing it? Remember, President Bush inherited a recession as well. That's when the Internet technology stocks um, and the companies uh, all fell apart. So President Bush inherits a recession. The question is, not who to blame because look, you couldn't blame the technology bubble all on President Clinton himself. Absolutely not. I mean, there's obviously a lot of people involved and enough blame to go around. You can. You, I just. I heard a story the other day about journalists questioning: Did they do enough during the last uh, couple of years to focus on what was happening, especially when it came to Fannie and Freddie and fueling the housing crisis? So that aside, every president inherits big problems because you are the leader of the free world. And there are going to be problems that you inherit. The danger, I think, a little bit, and I would say that you know, we fell into this a little bit as well, is that if you constantly uh, blame the person before you, you're not able to move forward and look forward. And I, I don't think that necessarily the country wants that right now. Everybody knows that the economy started to uh, decline during the Bush administration. That's not a secret. Uh, the question is, did they do anything? In the, did we do anything in the fall? President Bush take action to try to alleviate the downturn and. Statistics lag uh, you know, when you, take, you make a policy, and it takes a long time to see if that policy actually had an impact. You were just speaking earlier about the possibility that since we had a, a little bit of a better week on Wall Street last week, does that spell a turnaround? And can, that be, uh, can that, all that credit go specifically to President Obama? Well, I would say no. Uh, so we're just going to have to take a while to let all of this uh, settle down and let the policies that our administration and the new administration are trying to put in place have a chance to work. 202-737-0002, that's our line for Democrats, and 202-737-0001 if you're a Republican. If you're watching in Great Brit Britain on the BBC Parliament channel, 202-628-0184, or email us, the number's on the bottom of the screen, you spent 18 months behind that podium. Have you watched Robert Gibbs over the last two months? I haven't had time. No, I, really, I wasn't in the country to watch any briefings. You know, we didn't watch much TV, and especially when we were in Africa, we focused on, on helping those that we were there to help. Uh, I've, but I've seen some newscasts, and uh, he, I think he's doing a fine job. And it's, it is a very tough job. And you have to, all of a sudden, instantly become an expert on all sorts of issues. I think it's smart when you don't know the answer just to say, I don't know, but I'll get back to you when, as soon as I can. Um, so I haven't really had a chance to look at it. Was that the hardest part of your job, preparing, trying to understand? I think managing issues? this, my schedule, I think, was the hardest part because uh, you you manage a team and you uh, also need to be advising the president. But the rest of the administration looks to you for um, guidance on all sorts of issues. You can, and on any given day, you can be talking about foreign policy or environmental issues, and you have to be prepared for all of them. The the key for me was having a really good team in place, and I'm sure Robert Gibbs feels that he has a good team as well. You brought along some photographs I want to share with our audience. Uh, okay. you, you left on January 20th, went to Europe, and then ended up in South Africa in a town called Fishhook. Yes. Why did you go there and what did you do? I went there to uh, learn more about and feel something um, beyond statistics when it came to President Bush's PEPFAR program. PEPFAR stands for the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. In February of 2008, we went to uh, Africa with the president. We visited five countries in seven days. And I was astounded at how far a dollar can go to help people and how seriously they were taking it there and, and putting the money to good use in transparent and accountable ways. But I still didn't feel like I had learned enough or felt enough uh, about that program. And I used to say all the time, the statistics being that in 2001, 50,000 people in sub-Saharan Africa were getting antiretroviral treatment. President Bush took on that challenge, uh, created the PEPFAR program, and today 
over 2.2 million people are receiving those medicines. And I got a chance to meet a few of the women and men who have been helped by this program. It's called Living Hope. It's uh, there based in Fishhook, just south of Cape Town, for about 35 minutes south of Cape Town. The need in South Africa for a program like this, it's a, it is a faith-based program, it is a PEPFAR recipient, um, the need is great. And to me, the political situation in South Africa felt a little rocky. There's a lot of tension, and they have an election coming up April 22nd, and hopefully the country will be able to continue to pull itself together. It's a beautiful country. And this program, Living Hope, has gone beyond just helping people um, deal with their uh, HIV-positive status. They used to have a hospice because most of the people that came to help Living Hope died because of their disease. Uh, once they started getting the antiretrovirals, it absolutely flipped, and now about 80 to 85 percent of the people that come into their health care center, they now call it instead of a hospice, uh, live. Then they go home, but when they go home, they're living in uh, very impoverished areas and townships, and so they started home-based care. So they have people going in to see um, the patients. I got a chance to walk around the townships with the head nurse and really was touched. My heart was um, opened to all of them. And I think it was a really smart thing for me to uh, leave the country uh, to experience what I experienced there in Africa because I think it changed me uh, for the better uh, going forward. I hope to continue to work on those issues if I can in some way. As you talk to some of these children, mm -hmm. what surprised you the most about their actions or reactions mm -hmm. to you being there? What, what, what was great is that, you know, believe it or not, people actually love America. <laughs> I've, I've never fallen into the trap of believing that people hate America. Obviously, I know that there are some, but I think that those are on the fringes and they get a lot of media attention. These kids loved America. Um, they actually wanted to know if I'd ever met Chris Brown, who I guess is a uh, singer. I had eight years in the White House. I didn't know a lot about popular culture. And I said, no, but I know President Bush and President, I've met President Obama trying to gain uh, some credibility with these kids. Um, look, the children in most places, you know, if they are, are poor, they don't know it. Uh, these kids uh, are living in pretty tough conditions. You know, they don't even have running water in their homes, usually. Um, but they're happy, and they're coming to Kids Club every day that's run by Living Hope, and they're getting a snack there, and that might be the best nutrition that they got all day. You know, it's a sandwich and a piece of fruit, and they have a chance to be with one another and to feel safe for a little while and play games and do crafts. I went to one kids club that they had started in a, a township called Masi Fumalele. It was the second kids club because even though the government official estimates is that 15,000 people live there, they actually think it's more like 40 to 45,000 and people are just on top of one another living in you know the shacks that they are able to build. But this kids club, they all got together. They meet in the dirt and this is not nice dirt. It's not packed down. This is, you know, pretty trashy. It's a pretty trashy place. But these kids were singing songs and then they all got a piece of paper that they could color on. But there was nothing hard to, to color on. So they're coloring, you know, putting their leg behind the paper so that they could color or using, you know, my hand or my knee. And um, you could tell that they felt safe and happy there. The problem I felt was that some of them, you know, th the cycle of poverty is not going to be broken if they're not educated. And also the rate of HIV infection in the country continues to increase. And they have a very serious problem. And the children is where you can start to actually make a change in, in a generation or so. Kennesaw, Georgia for Dana Perino. Good morning on the independent line. Carl, are you with us? We'll move on to Algonac, Michigan. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Steve. This is Wilson from Algonac, my old buddy, you remember? Sure do. I talked to you. Wilson, could you do me a favor, turn the volume down on your television set, and we'll hear you a lot better. Oh, okay, Steve. Uh, I talked to you March 2nd in uh, last year, months before the election, and uh, I talked to you with Steve LaTourette. He was a congressman from uh, Ohio. Right. And uh, I pointed out that day, what my grandfather had told me when I was a kid about a snake oil salesman. And uh, the reason I point this out is because I, I think, and I would like your guests to comment on this, on promises and broken promises. 
all during the campaign we heard President Obama, I mean, berate to President Bush about lobbyists and tax frauds and attorney generals, et cetera, et cetera, and especially the earmarks. Now, in his campaign, which I think every American feels, when a man says something, that's his word, and he should live up to that word. But since in two short months he's had lobbyists on his own council that advises him, he's had men accused of tax frauds that were on there and also that were kicked off, weren't even allowed to be on. He has an attorney general who pardoned convicted terrorists and uh, who believes in that enemy uh, combatants have more rights than the security of our country. Now, with the earmarks and the greatest amount of debt this country has ever known, I think this is a reflection of what he will do in the future. Here's the thing. I think a lot of things are said during a campaign. And I think that our country would be better off if we all took the full pivot that we need to take to get beyond the campaign. And in some ways, I think that uh, all of us are still, f you know, uh, thinking in those in, in those terms. And I, what was said was said in the campaign. And the, the question is now, what do you do? And I, I think from a messaging standpoint, uh, some of the decisions may have left a f uh, people wondering um, what, if what was said in the campaign is what they're going to be able to follow through on. Uh, but here's the thing that I think is a good good thing to look at. Some of the key policies that President Bush put in place, from, you know, from my perspective, this is a good thing, uh, such as keeping the terrorists on the run, um, you know, fulfilling our uh, commitments in Iraq, keeping uh, teachers and parents accountable when it comes to educating our children. Those policies, if they are able to endure our that that is important. I think that uh, from a communication standpoint, uh, the new White House is uh, still finding its footing. There's there's so much that they have to deal with, and it's only been seven weeks. And I think everyone in the country wants to make sure that this president has a chance to get his feet on the ground. But the issue is, whenever you get into the Oval Office, everything does change. And so I think that uh, you know, let's. Let's hope that this next week is, is a new week where all of us could hopefully come together to work on issues more than looking for our differences. Graduate of the University of Southern Colorado and earned her master's at the University of Illinois, Fort Pierce, Florida, is next. For Dana Perino, good morning. Uh, hi. My name is Chris Williams. Uh, how are you doing, Ms. Perino? Good. Thank uh, you for calling. Okay. I, I have two questions. Um, do your faith-based programs uh, that you're involved in, do you ever go over to Jamaica? Because I have... My wife that I <clears throat> married there, she I filed for her and then soon to come over. And it's a lot of poverty over there. And um, I was, you know, I've been going over for three years, and I couldn't believe the poverty that's over there. So I just want, that was my first question. I, I, have, I personally have not. And while Living Hope is a faith-based organization, um, a Christian faith-based organization, there are lots of different types of faith-based organizations from different religions that are um, moving forward. I actually was there on the day, on a Friday, in one of the townships in South Africa where the mosque was passing out uh, food for the weekend for people that live there. And so it, it was interesting to me is that all the churches were working together, you know, while the, it is a um, uh, Living Hope is affiliated with the Baptist Church mainly, um, they had worked with the other churches in the area so that on Mondays the Catholics made the snacks for the kids and on Tuesdays the Anglicans and it went on like that and so they were all working together. Uh, I, I don't know specifically about Jamaica and whether or not um, they are a PEPFAR recipient. I, I would have to check that out for you. But I do know that there are programs through USAID, the State Department, uh, that try to help different countries. And the key to doing that is being able to uh, get the money uh, appropriated, uh, authorized and appropriated. But I also think another key, and this is something that Living Hope taught me, that I think Americans are willing to have some of their tax money go to help other people if they think it's actually having an impact, if they think that results are being achieved. And I can tell you at Living Hope, for sure they are. You know, they are stretching a dollar so far to make sure that people will be fed and housed and educated and cared for. And I think Americans can be very proud of that program, especially because it is very transparent and you have to show where that money is going so they are accountable to the American people and everywhere I went there were signs acknowledging 
the U.S. taxpayer and thanking the U.S. taxpayer for what uh, we were doing in order to try to help them achieve their mission. So I think you know, Jamaica and other countries uh, need our help, and it's not just Jamaica. I mean, everywhere you go, you find poverty in our own country as well. And there's a, it says something about poverty in the world when people are willing to work for peanuts, literally, you know, in terms of where we were in, in South Africa. I know that is the case elsewhere. I am sure that this administration uh, will try to help out countries. The best thing that we can do is try to help them grow their economies because we don't want them to be dependent on aid from the U.S. taxpayer. We want to give them a, a, you know, a helping hand to get to a more sustainable economic model. And the total amount allocated by President Bush for this type of assistance? Well, the most, I, I, I'm not sure on the, to, on, on the accumulative total, but I know that the Congress just authorized it was either 45 or $50 billion over the next five years for the PEPFAR program alone. And there's other uh, foreign aid as well that we provide. Next call is from Cooper City, Florida. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, I have a problem with um, two things. Uh, I, I agree also with this young lady about there's poverty right here in America. But when President Bush passed his big stimulus bill, uh, was supposed to go to banks to help the middle class who's mostly in foreclosure. Most of the homes in foreclosure you're going to find are the middle class. And now Obama's in 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 the White House. He's signing bills that is going to help the middle class and go and making very strict measures to make sure the money goes where it's supposed to go. Where Bush's money went to banks, and all they did was use the money to gobble up smaller banks, and they didn't help one person in foreclosure. If I could just take a couple of minutes to uh, react to that. Um, there, there were two different things. In, in January of 2008, um, President Bush worked with uh, Speaker Pelosi and Leader Reid and Leader McConnell and, and Leader Boehner to uh, pass a stimulus package. I don't remember the exact number, but it was about an eighth <laughs> of what was, well, this is the stimulus package in January of 98. Um, it was about an eighth of, of the most recent stimulus package. And that was to try to get the economy going again. Mm -hmm. Remember, people got checks in the mail. Last fall, the Troubled Asset Relief Program, the TARP legislation that passed, um, was to go to banks to try to, to, to find the major financial institutions to help them uh, avoid complete failure. Because what was happening when all that capital was frozen, nobody could get loans and, and nobody, the banks, they didn't even know what they owned themselves, so they didn't trust each other, they didn't trust themselves, and therefore the consumers were being hurt, especially as some of these subprime mortgages ballooned up and then people couldn't afford their payments. Uh, so that's, that money specifically was to go to financial institutions to get that money moving again so that the banks wouldn't fail, because if the banks failed, uh, what President Bush was told when he asked the question of what happens if we don't uh, pass this legislation, he was told we could face something worse than the Great Depression. I think it was the right thing to do to try to prevent the financial institutions from collapsing. Only time will tell if that was the right decision. I think right now people would say that it was. Then the second question is, then what do you do to help some of these homeowners that are facing foreclosure? We created Hope Now, which was a chance for, it was a private sector, public private initiative to allow people to call and try to get their loans reworked so that the payments would be reduced so that they could uh, afford to keep their home. But the other question is, and the legislation is not passed yet, I know you said that the legislation is being signed um, when it comes to uh, foreclosures and helping some of these people. It hasn't passed yet, and one of the reasons is because it's a very complex issue. And I, I, I hope that they do figure out something to be able to help some of, the pe some of these people, but the question is, how do you decide who is deserving and who is not? And if I have a mortgage that I've been paying faithfully, I've never missed a payment, I put 20% down, uh, and I'm not getting any help from the government, even though I'm in dealing in hard times as well, but my neighbor who had a subprime loan and might not have put 20% down and might have missed mortgage payments, do they deserve the help? And I think one of the arguments the administration would make is that making sure that whole neighborhoods don't fall apart is important and that will actually help everybody uh, that's living there. That's hard to convince, uh, it's, it's hard to convince everybody that that's actually fair. So I think that they have an uphill battle on that. And they're waking up this morning to another headline on the TARP money, the bailout, $170 billion given to AIG, and millions of dollars given in bonuses. 
Well, I think one of the things that, the, that AIG is saying, and this is another difficult issue, I think that Tim, Tim Geithner probably uh, you know, did the right thing. I don't know enough about the details of it, but to press AIG to say, is this really fair? I think what AIG is saying is that these, were, these promises for pay were made before any of this happened, and that people who are working there um, that are middle class people are expecting to get this bonus. If they don't get it, maybe they won't be motivated enough to try to help the company turn around. And getting the company to turn around and be more profitable is important for all of us. So it's a, it, I think it's, a, it's just it's so complex. And I think that the rhetoric in Washington can try to make things so black and white and make things sound so easy and make you know, demonize people when I don't, don't think that that's fair. I think if we all could just step back and realize that this is a very complex issue, there are a lot of different factors that led to it, uh, we need to take one step at a time to try to fix it, and we also need to have some patience. Next call, Hiram Georgia, Republican line for Dana Perino. Good morning. Good morning. I just wanted to make a comment and let Dana know that uh, they've been talking about all the heroes. Well, honey, you're my hero. Because <laughs> anybody that would go around this world and helping innocent babies and children are, is a big hero in my eyes. And I just wish that people would look that when the four, when President Obama and George Bush and the, and the two first ladies come together on them steps out of, with love, mm -hmm. that's what our country needs today. They need to come together, the American people, and work this out and quit doing all this blaming the past and blaming the new president. We all need to work together, honey. But I just want to tell you, I think you're beautiful. I've watched you all along. And you are a hero in my eyes, baby. Thank you. You know, I didn't really feel like a hero going to do that work. I actually felt like I could have been doing so much more all along in my life. I met some people, just amazing people. Mike and Pam Talley out of Tennessee uh, decided to leave uh, their careers and their families here at home, and they went to Living Hope, and they're volunteering for two years. I met a woman named Wendy Ryan, who was born in Trinidad, but came to the States in the 1970s. She was a journalist. She went to Living Hope to do a story, but ended up staying. And now she's lived there two years, and she's helped um, women who are HIV positive change their lives around and start a sewing business. And I bought some of their bags. There's a lot of heroes, and they're all over America. This is, you don't have to go overseas to help. You can help a neighbor. And President Bush uh, called the nation to service in 2001, we created USA Freedom Corps. There were two million more volunteers in America in 2008 than there were in 2001, so I think that had an impact. I know President and Mrs. Obama are encouraging people to continue that service. And so we just have a country that we can be so proud of. And I'm, you know, I'm just really, really proud to be an American citizen. Next call from Homewood, Illinois. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Hi. Um, I have a question for your guest. I went to South Africa in November, mm. and like your guest, I was very moved and overcome with the people. As a matter of fact, I went the week of the election, mm -hmm. and they were all very excited about the election if I knew the president. Mm -hmm. But my question is, how does one get in touch with um, your organization? Because I, too, would like to go back to South Africa as a volunteer. Uh, that's a great question, and it's actually something that I hope to work on in the future, is to try to help people figure out how they can go and volunteer, and if they want to take their families, um, because there are opportunities like that. Um, if you're affiliated with a church or um, a, a synagogue or a mosque, you can probably find those opportunities through them. Uh, otherwise, if you are just interested in Living Hope itself, their website is uh, www.livinghope.co.za. It's a little more complicated than uh, your regular .com. But, but if you go to cspan.org, we have a link. You can have it. Right. You can see it. And so then, and then you can see um, what you might be able to do. Um, it's pretty fascinating how many Americans were there. It was fascinating to me how many Americans were there, had gone, who were spending you know, six months or a year. I met two young people, one from the U.K. and one from the United States, who in, were in between uh, high school and college, and they decided to take one year, and in Europe they call it the gap year, take one year to go and help. What I would love to see is for baby boomers and retirees, those who are going to retire, and hopefully they'll be able to if we get their 401ks <laughs> replenished, but to have retirees consider taking a gap year. And, and before you know, taking 
all that time to travel and do your own thing, to maybe spend a year or two someplace, either in America or overseas, helping somebody else, because it's those people who have all the experience that can really make a difference. Next call is from Beaverton, Oregon. Good morning. Uh, Ms. Perino? Yes. Yes. You're a liar and suck my dick. Okay, I apologize for that. And huh. for people who get through, mm -hmm. uh, we do not in any way condone or appreciate that kind of language. And I apologize, it's Dana Perino, okay. for that call getting through. Next call is from Dallas, Texas. Good morning. Hey, good morning, Dana. Uh, my thing is this right here. I hear, I'm glad you went to Africa. Uh, I'm glad you went over there and done what you've done. Uh, I feel like y'all white. And America still want to pat blacks on the head. We do such good things for y'all. And uh, this is a call out for the Obama administration. Everybody missing it. Put a man on the moon back when Kennedy was the president. So why don't we look for, in the next 10 years, find a cure for HIV AIDS? Uh, it's ravaged in our community. Not only our community. AIDS has no color. It's going to uh, affect the white community, Latino community, our community. And I'm kind of getting sick of all the politicians coming on, talking about this and that. Hey, let's get a cure for this disease. Let's solve it. It'll help us out in the long run. And it's kind of disheartening to hear, like I say, yeah, you went to Africa, that was fine, but don't pat us on the head. If it was fair in America, the blacks here in America, they have Africa out a lot. Still a lot of racism here. I'm just kind of sick of the BS. Thank, great. thank you. And also this headline you may have seen this morning, HIV AIDS rate hits 3%, uh, translating to uh, almost 3,000 residents for every 100,000 in the District of Columbia. It's a very uh, well-written story, very well-researched, and uh, it's obviously very troubling. I'm kind of concerned that the caller thinks that I'm patting anybody on the head. I think that if, if we can, we should absolutely put the funds towards trying to find a cure for HIV AIDS. I know that there are scientists all across America and the world that are trying to find a cure for that and for also other, other diseases, you know, cancer obviously being the one that is one of our greatest killers as well as uh, heart disease. Um, there's a lot that can be done in, through education and I think that that is going to be a key to try to help prevent uh, the spread of the disease. What's next for you? Um, well, I, uh, my husband and I love being here in Washington, and um, we're enjoying uh, getting to know each other again. I didn't see much of him for the last eight years, and uh, we'll be here, and we're very excited because spring is obviously just around the corner. Let me ask you to react to the Outlook section of the Washington Post, uh, looking at the war in Iraq and the cast of characters, including President Bush and uh, former Defense Secretary Rumsfeld. And Philip Bennett makes this point that I want you to react to. With U.S. forces set to withdraw from Iraq over the next 18 months, does it matter that we know so little about how Iraqis have understood and lived through the war? The invisible connection between the overlapping experiences of Americans and Iraqis and the blame, the estrangement, and the hatred that has choked the air between them impairs our ability to see what will happen next. It also means that a U.S. official apply the lessons of the Iraq war to a strategy in Afghanistan. Look, I think Iraq and Afghanistan are very different um fronts. Uh, I, I believe they are the same war in terms of the war on terror, but Afghanistan starts from a much uh, more dire place in terms of not just you know, not having electricity and roads and, and the infrastructure that you need to have more of a modern society. Iraq is better off in that regard. They have a long way to go. I would always love more information. I'd love to know what more what Iraqis are thinking. I think that one of my concerns about the changing media is that the number of reporters is shrinking, not increasing, and doing this type of reporting is time, uh, it, it you know, takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of money to be able to go out there and get that information. Um, I think we know a lot about what some Iraqis feel, but if this gentleman thinks that we need to know, know more, I'm all for it. Our last call is from Philip, I'm sorry, from Springfield, Vermont. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my question maybe comes from a little bit a higher view, but how, my is how do we change from a focus on growth to a focus on sustainability? Everything we hear in the news is about growth, growth, growth. Growth can come out of sustainability, but I believe somehow we need to change the primary focus to sustainability. Thank you. I, I, I agree with you. I think that both can be done, and I think you see some really innovative uh, things around the country, especially with urban planners, who I think are some of our unsung heroes, and how they're trying to figure out a way so to, for people to be able to live in uh, more energy-efficient homes and drive more energy-efficient cars, but also live in neighborhoods where you can actually walk to the grocery store instead of having to drive. And there's a 
there's a movement towards that, and I think that's going to be uh, something exciting to watch. And I think the reason that you hear so many people talk about growth is because without economic growth, you can't create jobs. And if people aren't working, they can't afford their homes or their educations or their retirement. So I think that's why when, you're talk, when you mention growth, I think that's when you hear growth, I think that's what people are thinking about. Uh, but I think that people realize that moving forward, that sustainability can go hand in hand with growth. And I think that's an exciting uh, area of the economy. Let me go back to the New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine piece. And Karen Hughes is quoted in this article saying that former President Bush began thinking about his library and this presidential center in 2004 after he mm -hmm. was reelected. Where does he f see this fitting into his post-presidency? I think it will be a good central part of his post-presidency because that's where he wants to have an incubation of ideas for furthering freedom and democracy and encouraging people to uh, learn about uh, democracy and how to make it work in their own countries. Uh, I think it's natural that in 2004, after you're re you have a re-election, you know that there's going to be a presidential library and you start thinking about what would I want it to look like. And for anybody who thinks that it will be a partisan place or uh, one in which we're just trying to further President Bush's policies, I really think they should not worry about that. Uh, this will be a very exciting place. And I think that SMU uh, will be pleased to have it on their campus because it's going to be able to attract scholars and um, you know, big thinkers from all over the world to be able to come and have a place where their ideas can incubate and they can learn a lot and then we can learn a lot from them too. C-SPAN conducted a survey of 65 historians ranking the presidents and uh, George W. Bush was in the mid-30s uh, shortly after he left the White House. At what point do you think historians can adequately judge his presidency? Well, I think it'll be a long time from now. I think that it's so interesting to me that historians are always asked to rank somebody in current times and uh, you know last year uh, President Bush read three books on George Washington and if the first president is still being analyzed the f uh, historians are going to have a long time to analyze the 43rd president. Dana Perino former White House press secretary thanks for stopping by. Thank you. Come back again. Thanks for having me. There's a headline this morning actually yesterday morning in the Washington Post it's called Stewart's time to channel our anger. It's from uh, Saturday's Washington Post as Jon Stewart accuses CNBC of failing its audience. And we want to ask you, do you trust business news? The numbers will be on the bottom of your screen. We'll get to your calls in just a moment.